from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, row after row of iron on display, Louisville flooded with farmers. They can only mean one thing. It's the National Farm Machinery Show week, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Crop prices just keep creeping lower. It's really bearish. The USDA painted a very negative picture of the future in that report. While interest rates climb higher. The combination is creating nervousness across farm country, but is it spilling over into the ag equipment market just yet? On the dealer lot, are the number of new planters, new combines starting to visually, oh, they've got eight of them sitting there now when the last three years they had zero. Advocacy with a heavy dose of tenacity. How the weight of his ancestors' sacrifices fuel his farming legacy today. Plus, what's Valentine's Day without chocolate? The story behind the beloved Heath Bar. That's this weekend on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Now for the news, many producers breathing a sigh of relief on this news. EPA issuing an existing stocks order for dicamba products that were previously registered for over-the-top use. Now you remember earlier this month, an Arizona court vacated the approval of three products used over the top of dicamba resistant cotton and soybeans in 34 states. The court saying EPA did not follow procedures and failed to assess the risks and costs for non-users of dicamba. Now the EPA order authorizes a limited sale and distribution of existing stocks that are already in possession of people other than the registrant. This applies to stocks of previously registered pesticide products Ingenia, Tavium and Extendamax that are currently in the U.S. packaged, labeled and released for shipment prior to February 6. The American Soybean Association and the American Farm Bureau Federation applauding EPA's decision. Well, we also got our first look this week on USDA spring planting projections at the 100th annual Ag Outlook Forum. The agency forecasting that farmers will plant 91 million acres of corn. That's down more than three and a half million from last year and less than the trade had projected. The projections for 87.5 million acres of soybeans this year, which is up nearly 4 million acres from last year, and 47 million acres of wheat, down 2.6 million from last year. Combined, they're expecting more than 225.5 million acres, a drop of about 1% on expectations of lower prices and a return to a more typical level of prevent plant acres. You're talking about maybe that prices support soybeans a little bit more than corn, so maybe we move a little bit of area back into soybeans. That sorghum area is largely unchanged. Wheat, after responding to the global demand for wheat because of action in the Black Sea, farmers saying, okay, we'll move out of wheat, we responded. Cotton being perhaps one of the areas where we see a little bit of area growth, and certainly if weather is normal, some big rebounds in production. We're going to take a deeper dive into the numbers coming up in our roundtable discussion. Well, it was a big week for numbers at USDA. The agency also releasing all new, all encompassing look at America's farms and ranches. That's the 2022 Census of Agriculture. The census representing a count of U.S. farms and ranches and the people who operate them, something the agency only does once every five years. The numbers and statistics important for setting policy and priorities for USDA. So here are some highlights so far from the 757 page report. Let's start with the age of the average farm producer. In 2017, it was 57.5. It has increased now at 58.1. And how many farms are there in the U.S.? Well, according to the census, there are just over 1.9 million farms, a drop of almost 7% from the last census. However, the average farm size in acres has grown from 441 in 2017 to 465 in 2022, an increase of 5%. Texas is the top state for having the highest number of farms by county, followed by Missouri, Iowa, Ohio, and Illinois. This survey, in addition to all the amazing work and data that it contains, is a wake-up call. This survey is essentially telling us asking the critical question of whether as a country are we okay with losing that many farms? Are we okay with losing that much farmland? Or is there a better way? 
Looking at farm production expenses, we're talking about feed, labor, fertilizer, cash rents, seeds, and chemicals. From 2017 to 2022, they have grown from $326 billion to $424 billion. That represents an increase of $98 billion, or almost 30%. While per farm average net farm income has grown from more than $43,000 in 2017 to now almost $80,000 as of 2022, an 85 percent jump. Well, just a few years ago, the biggest source of income for many farmers was government payments. But USDA says that will not be the case this year. In 2020, direct government payments totaled $45.5 billion, but they dropped to $15.5 billion in 2022. Last year, they were down to $12 billion, and this year they're expected to dip again by about $2 billion to just over $10 billion, or a 16 percent drop from last year. Direct government payments will contract again in 2024, and that gives you an overall kind of direct government payment intervention total there of below the long run average. Experts say that's mostly due to lower supplemental and ad hoc disaster aid. That's it for the news. Well, parts of the Mid-South saw snow earlier this week, but then temps shot in the 60s later this week. But now colder air is on the way. We will have a check of your weather coming up next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. H&S 3200 action rakes are available in 8 and 10 wheel models and feature independent rake wheel suspension. When raised, the rake releases crop uniformly for a finished windrow. Learn more at the H&S website. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joining us now with weather. Matt saw some snow that started in Texas this week, then it hit the Mid-South. But as we're seeing more of this moisture, is it making a dent in the drought monitor? Yeah, starting going in a pattern of uh, dry and warm uh, through the uh, 20th and the 24th and see the pocket of eh, normal in terms of uh, precipitation, weather, drier right in the middle back into Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, back up here to the northeast. We're going to get a few clipper systems coming through. So that's why we're calling for a little bit above normal or possibly above normal precipitation in and across Pennsylvania in the northeast. Different story. This hasn't changed all that much. In fact, it seems like it's been this entire month that we've had the wetter than normal conditions on the west coast. Now things are going to try and shift, uh, getting back more to ridging across across the United States. I don't think that's going to help too much what's going on in uh, California uh, by shutting the faucet off, but that warm up is coming in and across the United States. This is February 24th, even through about the 28th. There's still a very high chance of above average, above normal temperatures uh, through the United States. So not a lot of cold air coming and if it does come through, it's just not sticking around uh, for a while. I think the last one is maybe two days worth of some colder temperatures before things start to come back up. That was this past weekend. Now coming up this week, we see a pattern where we're going to get that ridge building back across the United States and a typical uh, kind of signal showing up in the jet stream is the red line or the red contour pushing up here towards the north. That starts it and then the dominoes start to fall across the rest of the United States with that ridging uh, in and across the jet stream. So there's on Wednesday these little surges of energy in the jet stream. These little troughs that try to develop just can't break south to pick up some moisture and uh, result in uh, rain and snow across the United States. That's kind of what's going on there. This past weekend, there was a weakness in the ridge in the jet stream, which allowed some of these to kind of sneak on through. And that's kind of what we're going to go for for Friday, Saturday and Sunday of this week. These weak kind of clipper systems working down here to the south. Without this ridge here, we'd be talking about this being there and more substantial cold air outbreaks across the United States. But so long as, uh, again, that ridging is in and across the United States, uh, we stay warmer than average. Now, a quick check of that drought monitor. There is going to be some improvement as we go through uh, the rest of the week. And the latest drought monitor, that's going to be released uh, coming up on Thursday. Thanks, Matt. Well, talking to farmers this week, there is nervousness about just how low corn prices could go, but is there hope for corn prices and the fact that they may need to fight for acres? We'll talk about it in our marketing roundtables coming up from the National Farm Machinery Show. Matt Bennett, Joe Vaklovic and Alan Hoskins join us next. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the 2024 National Farm Machinery Show is brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. 
Welcome back to National Farm Machinery Show. This weekend, Joe Vaklovic, Alan Hoskins, and Matt Bennett are joining us for our marketing roundtable. Joe, we'll start off talking about, about the Ag Outlook Forum, a lot of different takeaways, but when you look at carryover for 2024, 2025, was it as bearish as what some has, had expected? Yeah, it's really bearish. The USDA painted a very negative picture of the future in that report, and none of it was surprising. It's not anything that the market or traders or farmers should have been surprised by. What I did after the numbers came out was I punched everything into a spreadsheet and started playing with numbers. What if we pick up some corn acres here and maybe lose some soybean acres, whatever. It's very, very difficult to paint a friendly picture no matter how you slice the numbers. What you're gonna need to see in all likelihood to really change things is a weather issue, whether it's South America with their second corn crop in Brazil or something in the US this spring or summer. It just seems very, very difficult to fathom a situation that, that turns friendly all of a sudden without some sort of supply disruption. Do you agree with that, Matt? I mean, what was your biggest takeaway from the Ag Outlook Forum this week? You know, I saw a couple of people comment right off the bat, 91 million acres, it could have been worse. But the bottom line is, is that even at 91 million acres using the USDA's methodology, you're talking 2.5 billion bushel carryout. And so uh, right now we're talking a 2172 for this particular marketing year. Last time we had over a 2 billion carry was back in 2018 time. And you know, your average cash price that year was 366 a bushel. So obviously we've already taken a pretty big haircut uh, if we continue down this path. And I fully expect that acreage uh, will be what the USDA said or more. Uh, I really struggle, like Joe said, to find a way to paint a bullish scenario without some sort of major weather issue, which again would be a supply driven type rally. It's more of a flash in the pan than building demand, which is what we sorely need to do right now. Alan, Ag Outlook Forum also, they did give some price projections, okay? Mm -hmm. So for 2024, 2025 for corn, it was 440 a bushel. That compares to 654 in the 2022, 2023 year, okay? So it means 1120 a bushel. Mm -hmm. But right now, as you're having conversation with farmers, what pencil is better on the farm? Most of the time right now, if you look at the predominant areas that we're in, beans look better than corn, certainly. Corn's a more challenging number. So that's, I think, where a lot of folks are looking but also they're trying to fine tune their pencils, make sure that they understand how the input costs work and develop that marketing plan around those numbers. Do you think, Joe, that when you look at this acreage debate, this battle for acres, considering where corn prices are, do you think corn prices have to rally to buy some acres heading into spring? No, it's not a battle. It's like a war of attrition. Neither, neither crop needs the acres. We could, we could stand to lose 5 million acres and probably still be comfortable overall. The fact of the matter is the corn soybean pie, if you want to put it that way, is going to stay about the same for the most part. And if you move 2 million here, move 2 million there, I just, I think it still leaves you with kind of a, a negative looking situation, uh, big picture. Matt, I talked to a farmer in Michigan earlier this week. He said, listen, time, we just bought a new corn planter. If corn prices don't get better, we are not going to touch that corn planter this year. We're going to go all soybeans. I mean, these are the types of conversations that we're hearing for farmers right now. It seems like the acreage debate is still, I mean, it's far from over. So here's the challenge that the U.S. producer has. Uh, the fall of 2023, just a few months ago, uh, the, the pencil worked better for corn versus beans, which I'm sure Alan would agree with. Mm -hmm. The problem is that whenever the pencil works better for corn versus beans, that's an economic decision that you're making on acreage. We need to do something about uh, what is making us make that decision, which was the price of corn at the time versus the price of soybeans. And so now you're in a position, if you didn't sell corn, same position we were in for the 23 crop, unfortunately, because we spent a lot of money on inputs, didn't sell the corn. Now we're in the same pickle we were in before. And I, I think uh, your swing acres probably go to beans. I agree with Alan, uh, maybe on, on kind of his premise there. The problem, you've quantified a ton of corn acres at this point. And so bottom line is, I, I, I think there's too many acres right now overall, both corn and beans. Alan, are you seeing farmers make cuts? And if so, what are they cutting? Well, first and foremost, the first thing that's to look at always inputs. I don't necessarily think that that's the best strategy at times. I think there's a lot of other areas that can be considered. There's items, for example, and this is never a popular one, but living expenses number of the, one of the things that's the most difficult to cut, but in many instances, that is an area that needs to be looked at. Well, we're just getting started. Do we have enough demand to chew through these growing supplies? That's what we're gonna talk about, but we need to take a quick break and then we'll be back right here from U.S. Farm Report.
Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report, a roundtable marketing discussion. Okay, we were talking about carryover for the 2024, 20, 2025 year, Joe. We got the expectations from, from the Ag Outlook Forum. But as you look at demand, how much more demand do we need to see to pick up to chew through these supplies? We need a lot more. Um, but that being said, I actually, I think there were a couple numbers in the Outlook Forum that USDA may be light on in terms of demand. Uh, the soybean number uh, for crush, I think is too low. They've got a 100 million bushel increase penciled in uh, this year to next year. Actually, I think they're they're too light for both marketing years. So I think you could make a case that you pick up 150, 200 million bushels, um, two marketing years combined in soybeans. Now, that being said, at the same time, I believe USDA is overstating soybean exports for new crop. They've got a build in soybean exports being projected for next year when we know for a fact that Brazil is going to expand again. And if Brazil doesn't run into dryness like they did this year, you know, you could be talking, what, 170 million metric ton crop out of Brazil next year. So um, there are some some swing items in corn. I think they could be a little light on corn for ethanol. This uh, sustainable aviation fuel deal is is very much the real deal. It's happening. And I don't know if they fully quantified it or adjusted for it just yet. No, I mean, last week on the show, we had somebody on from Southwest Airlines and we were talking about it and it's the, the, the carbon intensity score is lower to ship sugar up from Brazil than it is to use corn in the U.S. So we think that this is going to be a huge demand, but reality is today we have a sustainable aviation fuel plant that's not even chewing through corn. Well, uh, we've got to get the tax credits approved for corn-based ethanol. Bottom line is we need it. it. It's probably going to happen based upon most of our sources. Uh, but, uh, you know, I agree with Joe. I mean, when you're looking at demand, for instance, for this marketing year, if Brazil would run into some weather issues, which they're showing some tendencies to turn off dry once again, and there's been such extremes there uh, that the possibility that you could see that Sabrina crop maybe get dialed back is there. I think in that case, uh, the USDA could probably increase corn exports with that weather situation. I do think whenever you're looking at corn-based ethanol, corn usage for ethanol, uh, there's definitely a chance we can go up 25, maybe even 50 million more bushels. It would really be nice if you could get the carry in for this next marketing year under two. And if you do, it's probably going to put you in a little better situation to withstand uh, what we're looking at. Last thing is on soybeans. If you're looking at 87 and a half million acres and only a 440 or whatever it was on the carry, that's not the end of the world uh, with 87 and a half. With 87 and a half, you could have made the case for much higher stocks. But I'm with Joe. I think Crush is going to continue to be a real bright spot for us. Well, other than commodity prices, also looking at interest rates. And mm -hmm. Alan, I mean, the, the expectation this year was we would see interest rates come down. We're watching the signals from the Fed. Mm -hmm. Yet the past couple of weeks, we've seen interest rates creep back up. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, certainly if you look at where consumer prices have come in, they were a little bit higher than anticipated. And that would seem to be a primary driver of why we've seen those take back up a little bit. So then what conversations are you having with farmers right now as they're looking at interest rates continue to, to, to climb, uh, but the commodity price picture, as Joe and Matt have told mm -hmm. us, is, is it that bright? Well, I think Matt used the proper phrasing when he talked about withstanding, because potentially with where we are today, if you look at the majority of operations with commodity prices being where they are, we're going to be very profit challenged. However, it is a reality that we're dealing with. Marketing plans still have got to be enacted. And even though it's not necessarily the most rosy of pictures, this is something that needs to be planned for. And when, as Joe talked about, if there's a weather opportunity, when the selling opportunities present themselves, that's why those marketing plans are important so they can enact those, make sure to take, take advantage of those opportunities. Alan, Joe, Matt, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. All right, coming up after the break, we're going to do the impossible. We're going to try to find Machine and Repeat here at National Farm Machinery Show. I'm telling you, it's almost impossible. But we need to take a quick break, and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. Welcome back to National Farm Machinery Show. Well, we cannot be here without finding the machinery, Pete. It's been a great week so far, Greg. And what do you have this weekend for tractor tails for us? Hey, we are going to North Dakota to check out a classic 1952 model. This 1952 G is uh, also a tractor that my dad farmed with when I was growing up. And so when I saw this one, it was just like the one he had. I thought I should probably have that. Well, the uh, G was uh, actually the biggest row crop tractor that John Deere built until about 1953. They had a place, you know, in the, a lot of farm operations where they needed more power. I have plowed with it before, so I've taken this on some tractor drives. 
usually a group of uh, old tractor enthusiasts get together and, and they go from one town to another maybe and have dinner and then go back to the starting point. A lot of times if we're in a town that has a nursing home and have the residents out so they can see us go by and they wave. Thanks so much, Greg. All right, well, coming up, we're going to explore used equipment trends with none other than this guy, plus a look at technology trends in the new equipment sector. That's coming up next right here at National Farm Machinery Show. You're watching U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. New numbers out from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers shows four-wheel drive tractor sales grew 1.4% in January, the only segment to post growth last month. But that's not stopping major ag equipment manufacturers here at National Farm Machinery Show from rolling out new equipment and introducing new technology to help ease the load on the farm, as we show you this weekend in our Farm Journal report. Hot off the manufacturing line, Case IH rolled out a new combine just two weeks ago, and the key feature is automation. It's a feature and I could talk about a feature, but more importantly, it's solving the number one issue our customers have today, which is labor scarcity. And not only labor scarcity, but the skill of that laborer. This AF11 combine comes with AFS Harvest Command, something Case IH also launched in mid-range combines last summer. You get in this machine, you use our Harvest Command feature set, you're taking a relatively untrained operator and making them an expert by using those automation features. Kirk Coffey is VP of North America for Case IH, who grew up on a farm in Indiana, and he says last fall he witnessed this machine at work. We were running about 7,000 to 7,200 bushel an hour, which we run a 9250 on my farm. This is above what we, we do today. And the engineer that was driving um, said, well, watch this. And he went all the way to 8,000 bushel an hour, which is mind blowing. I'm calculating how many semi trucks do we need? And um, we kept it there. Coffee says running that many bushels through this machine at once, his farmer instinct kicked in. The first thing I wanted to do was look at grain sample. So we kept it there, we had the throughput, we had the cleanliness and the quality, which is core to Case IH and our axial flow heritage. So a main takeaway was the farmer that really has to do more with less, labor scarcity, I don't have as many operators so I need to get more out of my combine so I can put somebody running the grain leg or running a semi. We're really solving that challenge. While labor continues to be one of the biggest pain points for farmers today, Full autonomy is still on the horizon for Case IH. We aren't towards full autonomy, which was your question, until we automate every little building block along the way, driving, turning, loading or unloading, um, setting the machine, which is this harvest command feature. But each building block uh, along the way towards full autonomy is what we're working on. Farm Journal's technology editor Matthew Grassi was on hand at the Consumer Electronics Show, or CES, earlier this year in Las Vegas. Ag was pretty prevalent on the floor there. A lot of stuff talking about artificial intelligence and agriculture, using that to make farmers' uh, decision-making process simpler, more accurate. While autonomy continues to be a focus for ag at these shows, this year there was also a push for electrification. Taking these tractors and electrifying them, getting away from diesel, was seemed to be a trend and a lot of automation and robotics. So uh, it touched really on all the uh, all the trends in tech, I would say. As we found out last year at CES, electrification doesn't make sense for larger equipment. In certain power levels with certain uh, customer duty cycles, the answer is, is probably yes. Um, and, and in rough terms, I would say roughly 100 horsepower and under and relatively light duty cycles, uh, lithium ion chemistry batteries, can work. Like you can package enough energy into the, the tractor to make that work. As you get into higher power levels, the answer to that is no. I, you know, I, in the keynote yesterday, I talked about the 8R tractors. When I ran the numbers on, if you powered that with a, with a lithium ion battery today, it's, it's uh, you know, twice the volume, twice the, the weight, twice the mass, and four times the cost. Like that just doesn't pencil. Instead, this year, Grassi says one of the coolest things he saw was with Bobcat. I would have to start with the, uh, the Bobcat AT450X 
enabled by Agtonomy Utility Tractor. It was just a, a, a an amazing ecosystem that they've created on this electrified automated tractor. And really the, the real power and brains behind it is the mobile app that Agtonomy, the team there, has designed for it. I mean, you can pass this thing from, you could be hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away through the through the app, and it's just really powerful, giving those farmers more time to spend uh, doing the things they love versus sitting on a tractor. Like most electric tractors today, it's a smaller machine that's filling a need in California. Right now, finding a home on high-end vineyards. So, seems like a specialty crop-focused uh, solution, but... I think that the combination of tech there has some interesting applications to row crop as well. Machinery Pete says even with commodity prices creeping lower, equipment is still in high demand. The advancements with new equipment, farmers are leaning in. Uh, it's all about ROI. So if, if this new piece of equipment, this new combine, this new high speed disc, whatever, if it can make them better, even though dollars are tighter, my sense is farmers are willing to do that. But the one thing he's watching closely is supply on dealer lots on the dealer lot are the number of new planters, new combines starting to visually, oh, they've got eight of them sitting there now when the last three years they had zero. That'll make an impact and then also supply on the U side. Machinery Pete says mid horsepower equipment is in the highest demand today. Where he's seen some softening is with used combines. Still see some shifting there. Started a little bit early 23, but the supply built up and uh, we're just, it, that segment is changing quickly here in early 24. So. Some better buying opportunities, I think, definitely in that six to 10 year old range with combines. And he says the pre-def combines are still holding up strong. So 2011 and before, when we look, our auction data shows they maybe dropped, you know, two to four percent last year. Whereas if you get in that six to 10 year old range, you might be talking 18 to 22 percent drop. Now it's interesting, the later model combines, the one to three year old, through the end of 23, were holding pretty good. But it's going to be really interesting to see as we start to see more of those sold in 24, how those one to three year old ones do. I think they're going to soften up a little bit. While Machinery Pete is watching equipment values show some signs of change, he says it's impressive to see just how resilient overall farm machinery prices continue to be. Well, a new deforestation certification could throttle imports into Europe. We have all the details in Ag Around the World next. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the 2024 National Farm Machinery Show is brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Now for a glimpse of agriculture around the world. We've been covering extensively the backlash from European farmers over the area's climate push, but there's another change that could impact exports to Europe. Steve Nicholson, Rabobank's global sector strategist for grains and oilseeds, says it's something to watch as it could start to change the flow of grains and oilseeds in 2025. January 1 of 2025, everything they import has to have be certified that it's deforestation free. And, and this is a huge deal. So if you're shipping soybeans from the United States, you basically have to have, every bean has to have like an art provenance that yes, this was grown on a, a piece of ground that is, is certified non from deforestation ground. So that way we can take it. Nicholson says the full impact of such a drastic move is unknown, but it will hit not just farmers, but grain companies and cause companies to ramp up logistics, as well as certifying any product that flows to Europe. So it's a very expensive supply chain because you're basically doing an IP supply chain. How do we do that and make sure we follow that soybean, for example, all the way through the line? Because Europe is a big importer of soybeans because they feed meal uh, in the European market. The changes may still be 11 months out, but Nicholson says it will take time to adjust the supply chain to deliver those needs. More short term, Nicholson says the ongoing war in Ukraine is also impacting the flow of grain. Yet Ukraine has been able to export record amounts of grain despite the war. They shipped in November, December, some of the largest import exports of all time out of Ukraine, and it's going through all sorts of different. So we have to continue to watch that world that part of the world, it is very important that Ukraine continues to be a part of the production around the globe. Nicholson says good weather in Ukraine helped to boost production last year, but the country's also getting creative in how they ship grain. They've sort of snaked the ships up the western bank of the Black Sea into those, those ports in the southern, kind of southwestern part, 
you're seeing investment in the Danube quarter, and so they're, you know, Ismail, they're bringing stuff through there. They're also, stuff is going by rail north into the Baltics and out that way as well. And so there's a, it's a piecemeal sort of process rather than just going to the Black Sea and shipping it out. And in Spain, farmers are continuing to protest, seizing control of streets and roads across various cities. Using their tractors, it's reported they've disrupted vital routes leading to Madrid. They're protesting in hopes the EU government announces measures to safeguard the future of farming activities. The farmers are concerned about measures that would cause production cost hikes, cut into profits, and spark unfair competition from non-EU countries. The demonstrations are expected to continue for several more days, with more protests being organized in the capital for next week. Well, things were pretty bearish heading into USDA's Ag Outlook Forum this week. The expectation for much larger stocks and much lower commodity pricing. But it wasn't as bearish as what many analysts thought. Why? Well, we'll tell you in Chip's Corner next. Welcome back. Chip Flory here for Chip's Corner this week from National Farm Machinery Show. Chip, there's a lot that you covered here, but what good stuff do you have for us this week? Well, let's take a look at what we got from USDA at the Ag Outlook Forum and the Commodity Outlooks. I'm going to give you two numbers to think about that are in the reports that maybe aren't getting a whole lot of focus, and that's 17 and a quarter and 4.8. 17 and a quarter billion bushels of total corn supply, 4.8 billion bushels of total soybean supply. Yeah, they're big numbers. Okay, the market's goal between now and the end of the 2024-25 marketing year is going to be to figure out how to use as many of those 17 and a quarter billion bushels of corn, 4.8 billion bushels of soybeans. Time. That's just an. I, <laughs> listeners of AgriTalk over the years have heard me say this a lot. That's just a nice way of saying if we're searching for demand. We're talking about lower prices because of those big total supplies. Okay, I heard a lot of analysts say, you know, this Ag Outlook Forum, it wasn't as bearish yeah. as, one, as some thought it would be, but I hear those numbers and those sound pretty bearish, Chip. Yeah, it's, it's the overriding trend, I think, is reflected in those two numbers. And we have to understand the market's job. The market's job is to find use for as many bushels as possible, and that is by way of lower prices. Okay, when you look at the Ag Outlook Forum, though, how much weight do these numbers from USDA this early on in the season, how much weight do those even carry? Yeah, it, they, it, it carries quite a bit of weight because it's the only set of 2024-25 numbers that we've got from USDA. So it's the number that is universally looked at. Am I saying that each number is right in those balance sheets? No way. No way, there's a couple of numbers that I don't agree with. The trends are right in soybean demand, but they don't push crush hard enough. The trend is right in corn for ethanol demand, but they don't push that number hard enough. So there, the, the market is gonna find some use for the 17 and a quarter and a 4.8. Chip, last question for you, boil it down for us. There are a lot of numbers, a lot of data to comb through from the Ag Outlook Forum. What is the biggest takeaway? The biggest takeaway is that we didn't get to 3 billion bushels of corn in this initial outlook. And, and that's why most are saying this number isn't as bearish as what we thought it was going to be. All right, Chip, as always, thanks for the clarity. We appreciate it. All right, stay with us. We have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report next, including it is Valentine's week. We are taking you to the home of the Heath Bar. Chip, it's going to make us both hungry, all right? <laughs> Traveling the countryside with Andrew McRae next. Well, it's only fitting we have this sea of red behind us because it was Valentine's Day this week. And if you got your special someone something sweet, you're not alone. Chocolate and candy is big business during the Valentine's season, reaching $1 billion in sales every year. So it's only fitting Andrew McRae takes us to the home of the Heath Bar as he travels the countryside this weekend. The story begins with L.S. Heath in Robinson, Illinois. And he owned a dairy, and he uh, opened this store up in 1914 for his sons to have a soda fountain and a lunch counter. As Pam Hall shares, the brothers used their farm background and new business as a way to dabble in possible new products, and one of those offerings was a kind of candy. They started messing around with different candy recipes, and this is where they created the Heath Bar. The new candy carried the family name 
but the Heath Bar may have remained popular just locally, if not for a twist of fate that brought it to a huge audience. During World War II, they uh, got a contract with the government to put Heath Bars in the mess rations for the soldiers because it was less likely to melt like the other candies that they'd put in there. The English toffee-style candy bar performed well in battle, so to speak, and it left an impression on all who ate it during the war. When all of the soldiers came home, then they wanted Heath Bars, and so then they had orders for all over the country. For many years, all of that candy was made right here in this very store. They had a kitchen upstairs, and they uh, cooked a lot of their, well, they cooked all of their candy upstairs and shipped it out. This was a family-owned company until 1989 when it was sold to Leaf. And then in 1996, it was sold again to the Hershey Company. However, even with those changes, one thing has remained the same. They had an agreement with the companies that bought the factory that they wouldn't take the Heath Bar out of Robinson because it's kind of our only claim to fame that we have. And so they've honored that and kept the Heath Bar in Robinson. It's a story that began in this very building back in 1914, but what truly makes it special is that every Heath Bar ever made has come from this town, a story that still brings people here from around the globe to this very soda fountain. Traveling the countryside in Robinson, Illinois, I'm Andrew McCray. Thanks, Andrew. You can check out more of Andrew's travels on our Farm Journal YouTube page. There's a special playlist for all of Andrew's stories, so make sure that you subscribe. Up next, his great-great-grandfather was the first African-American to come out of slavery and purchase 60 acres of farmland in Virginia in the late 1800s. And today, it's that foundation that's propelled P.J. Haney to grow and flourish in his own way. How P.J. Haney is breaking barriers, next. Farm Journal's Smart Farming Week, exploring innovation on the farm and technology of tomorrow, ready for today. The latest Ag Census data released just this week shows the number of black farmers fell by 8% in the past five years, the largest decline among all ethnic and racial groups. The number of black farmers has dropped from a peak of almost 1 million in 1910 to 41,807 in 2022. And if you talk to P.J. Haney, he doesn't shy away from the fact he is a minority in farming. Working some of the same land his great-great-grandfather farmed is both a privilege and an honor, and one he doesn't overlook. But in order to grow, he knows he needs to break barriers. This weekend, we introduce you to Haney, as he was honored last week as a top producer of the year finalist. No step is too big for top producer finalist P.J. Haney. His farming legacy is being built on deep family roots. My family lineage dates back to my great-great-grandfather who was the first African-American to come out of slavery and purchased 60 acres of land on September 14, 1867 in Northumberland County, Virginia. Today, his family still owns and operates a portion of that land, now spread across four counties in the northern neck of Virginia and near the Chesapeake Bay. I spent a lot of time with my dad. I was his walking shadow. And I tell folks that my dad tricked me into farming. You know, as I was on the floor carpet farming with my toys, I matriculated to the bigger toys, the real ones. After graduating from Virginia Tech, Haney returned to the family operation looking to build a future with a focus on technology and improving efficiency. Instead of planning from sun up to sundown, you know, dad would say, hey, you can take that bubble on that roof and you can work half the night, can't you? And I said, yeah. So he said, all right, we'll get you in a big field so you can work tonight. And that way, you know, it increased our productivity with the equipment by being able to work longer days and longer hours. One of five kids, today, he and his four sisters still work together on the farm. But in 2010, while helping start and run a nonprofit called the National Black Growers Council, Haney found himself in the Arkansas Delta. You know, if we had a farm down south, we could probably start planting three to four weeks before we start here in Virginia. And with the equipment, we have our own trucks. Let's haul a tractor and a planter down and some equipment down, get it done, and then bring it back up to Virginia to spread the cost of that equipment over more acres. 16 hours and a thousand miles from home, Haney went to work, building a satellite operation in Phillips County, Arkansas. He's learning to plant on raised beds and furrow irrigate. It also opened the door to his newest endeavor, restarting an abandoned rice mill. And when we went to this facility, we saw a, I should say a diamond in the rough. We saw an opportunity. Today, he's running the nation's only black-owned rice mill. 
And thanks to new USAID contracts, he's helping to feed the world. It's a mission he takes seriously as a farmer and as a member of the black row crop farming community. You know, in 1920, there were a million black farmers in this country and African Americans owned 16 million acres of the land. Present day, there are less than 15,000 black row crop farmers and less than 2 million acres of black owned land. And if we don't continue to keep our foot on the gas, black men and women in row crop production and agriculture are gonna be extinct. A mission he's working to fulfill every day. And I'm hoping that my interest and my advocacy work will show others in the country and other young men you know, who I, you know, was in their shoes one day, that through hard work and tenacity and, and faith, you know, opportunities can come your way. Congratulations to P.J. Haney, a finalist for the 2024 Top Producer of the Year. Talk about a genuine guy whose vision is broad with big plans in the years ahead. Congratulations to P.J. and the entire Haney family. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you to everyone who joined us here from National Farm Machinery Show this week. It was great to see so many familiar faces, but also to meet many loyal viewers. Well, that's what makes this show so fun each year. Well, we're back in the studio next week, and we hope that you join us as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.